Hi, this is Chuck Arnlau, and I'm the Chuck of the Markets Up, Chuck. And uh, today's um, post was titled The Essence of Valuation Part 1, where we're going to look at companies that grow, um, first of all, between zero or we'll say 1% to 8.5%, um, which there are many. And then there's another section of companies that grow from like 85 up to 15. These numbers kind of blend a little bit. And then finally, what I call pure growth stocks, which we'll discuss tomorrow, that grow 15% a year or better. But when you're looking at companies that grow less than, um, you know, 15% or so, then their price-earnings ratios are going to be dependent on on a formula that Ben Graham produced in his book, The Intelligent Investor, that um, that I referred to in the blog. A couple of just quick facts to put this all into perspective. Number one, the average price-earnings ratio on the S&P 500 over the past 80 years or so has been approximately 15. The past the price earnings average price earnings ratio for the last 25 years has been approximately 17 or slightly higher. And the point I'm making at is that companies trade at this normal price earnings ratio for reasons that we're going to discuss here today. So let's start off by looking at real slow growth. I'm going to start with Consolidated Edison, a utility electric utility company. I want you to notice here that their earnings growth rate has been approximately 2%. But applying Ben Graham's formula of two times the growth rate plus um, um, a kicker for for interest rates, um, and then of course the baseline of eight and a half, we end up getting a price earnings ratio here of about 12.4, which represents the value according to Graham's formula. Now again, this is a guide; it's not perfect. In the case of a slow grower like this, I want you to notice that the normal price earnings ratio has been about 13. And that's a little bit loose, but I do want you to take note of this. If you're paying below 13, you're making a reasonably intelligent buy. If you're paying above 13, then you're paying a valuation that's much too high. The green area, the light blue turquoise area here, represents dividends. This company does pay a rich dividend, and that's really where your return is going to come from. But I do want you to notice that the 2% growth rate correlates very closely to the actual appreciation that the shareholders received. Um, in this case, we're talking about an 18-year period. And by the way, and I stopped these charts in 2007 so that I can eliminate what I call recession bias. I want you to see this under what I would call more normal um, circumstances rather than an extreme circumstance. But you can see there's been a very strong correlation, and something around 12 to 15 times earnings becomes, you know, the only sensible price earnings ratio that you want to pay. You're going to get most of your return here from dividend, um, and, and your appreciation is going to correlate very closely to your growth rate, even though you're paying a higher price earnings ratio of something like, you know, 12 to 15 times earnings intelligently to buy this stock. My next example is um, DPL. Inc., another utility, I want you to notice we have a 3% growth rate. Look at the close correlation, and I do want to always emphasize if you overpay, the normal price earnings ratio for this company has been about 15, and Graham Dodd's formula calculates it at 14.5, so it's certainly consistent with that. The slightly higher normal is explained by some of these overvaluation periods, but make it clear here that you don't want to overpay for these things because you really destroy your rate of return. The long-term shareholder return on this is a little higher than you saw in the previous example because I want you to notice it started out at a discount to its its Graham Dodd justified P.E. ratio, a low P.E. ratio. It ended with a higher P.E. ratio, but still there was a very strong correlation to the company's growth rate and what shareholders returned given that you paid a reasonable price earnings ratio. My next example is H.J. Uh, Hines, and again, you have now a 3.5% grower. I want you to notice the correlation. Look what happens when, you know, if you overpaid for, for Hines. You want to pay something around 15 times earnings to buy this company. According to the Graham Dodd formula, it's currently trading at 18. That would indicate it's a little pricey, but it does have a high dividend yield. Once again, a 3.6% growth rate, 4.8% rate of return to shareholders, not counting dividends. You know, your return is going to come from yield here. You're looking at things on these first examples that, you know, much closer correlate to the kind of returns you can expect from bonds and CDs or other fixed income because these are relatively low growers that are getting most of their return from yield. But the point I want to make is you don't want to overpay for these companies, especially the slow growers like you would have been doing, you know, back here in this period from 1995 up through you know, 1998 or 9. Those were periods where the stock was overpriced based on, you know, what I would call reasonable valuation formulas. In our next example, Tootsie Roll, we get exactly the same type of scenario. We have about a 6% grower. I want you to notice the track record is now 10%. It's a little bit higher because the company started, again, undervalued. This is the essence and importance of valuation and ended overvalued, but you only have a 6% grower. Once again, you never want to buy the stock when it's trading at a high valuation uh, because, you know, high valuation will ultimately lead to low rates of return because you don't have that much growth here. 
The next example is Kimberly Clark, and you're getting into a little faster growth here, about 6.8% growth. Um, but again, I want you to notice there's a very strong correlation between the company's actual growth rate and the rate of return that shareholders earn. Um, a normal P.E. ratio for this company has clearly been about 17. You don't want to pay, you know, Graham Dodd's formula says you can pay up to 22, but that's why I draw these charts, because I really don't want to pay, even though that's what Graham Dodd's formula suggests, by having the perspective of this fabulous tool here, I can see that, you know, 22, which is the green line here with the, um, 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 white triangles is obviously a very rich price earnings ratio. I, I'd be much better off once I have this information, you know, paying something around 15 to 18 times earnings to buy this company. It makes a lot more sense to buy it when it's on sale rather than to buy it when it's fully valued like that again because the growth is only 6.8 percent. If I move on to Hershey's, you can see, you know, the, the formula says here for a very high price earnings ratio, but the chart clearly tells you you do not want to pay that high a price earnings ratio to buy this company because if you did, if you're paying this high price earnings ratio, you're generally going to be taking higher risk, as I point out in the post, and get an expected lower rate of return. So you want to try to buy this company um, at a price earnings ratio that makes sense. And historically, that's been 20. You know, 20 has been a reasonable price earnings ratio, but keep in mind you're paying 20 times earnings only to get about 8.7% growth. You can see once again that the correlation between the company's earnings growth and its uh, return to shareholders has been very, very close. My next example, looking at McDonald's using the Graham Dodd adjusted, you know, charts. Again, Graham Dodd's formula says I could pay a much higher price earnings ratio. However, if you'll notice on this chart around, you know, around 20 times earnings, 19 to 20 times earnings makes a lot of sense. If you overpay, you hurt your rate of return. But here's a company growing at about 11 percent. But again, you still want to be careful. You don't want to pay very, very high price earnings ratios like you would have been paying in 1999 to buy companies. It's very important to get the valuation correct. Um, the, Regardless of the um, of earnings for here's a 10.7% grower, you get 11.7% rate of return. Again, a very, very strong correlation to earnings growth versus return valuation or the price earnings ratio you pay, though, is critical. And my final two examples will be Procter & Gamble. You're now getting past the 10% number. You've got about 11.6% growth rate. I want you to notice that, you know, you end up with a 13% rate of return. Um, you know, not counting dividend income again, which is the light blue area here. That does help. But you don't want to overpay for these companies. You want to make sure, and that's what this tool is helping us do, make sure that we're buying at or below its reasonable growth. And my final example would be Johnson & Johnson. I wanted to show this because now you're getting up to that, close to that 15% growth that we'll be talking about tomorrow. But I do want you to see a very strong correlation. Once again, overvaluation hurts. Here you've got a 14% grower, and you've got about a 14% rate of return, 13.7 versus 13.8, not counting dividends. You know, getting valuation right is a very important component. And, you know, the idea behind today's blog was to give you the essence of valuation and to have, you know, have a tool here that gives you a perspective of when the right time to make a long-term investment decision on a company like this is. This is Chuck Carmel. Thanks for listening. I'll, I'll look forward to presenting part number two where we look at faster growth tomorrow.